All right, folks, so our next talk is by Dr. Ahmed Abdeen Hamed. He is a postdoctoral research fellow working on research supported by Vermont EPSCoR at the University of Vermont. This talk is entitled Modeling the Impacts of Climate Change on Water Quality in Lake Champlain. Design of an Integrated Assessment Model Using Pegasus Scientific Workflow. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. As, uh, as the gentleman here says, we are going to be discussing the climate change and how the climate change will affect the water quality of Lake Champlain here. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about a computational framework. I'm not going to be talking about modeling processes and I'm, going to, I'm not going to be showing results. I'm basically a computer scientist who is very passionate about environment and climate and biodiversity, obviously. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this from a computational uh, framework standpoint. And I'm not going to be delving into the actual models and how the models work. Um, I am part of a big group uh, we actually call ARAD, which stands for Research on, um, on Adaptation to Climate Change. Uh, we have a few groups, in fact. But before I forget to talk about the groups, I would like to talk about the co-authors of this work. Dr. Asim Zia, uh, Ibrahim, um, Gabriela, Yushu, um, Peter, Scott, I believe Scott is here. And um, we also collaborated with the folks from University of Southern California, uh, the ISI, um, Matt Range and uh, Dr. Dillman. Um, we're, we are not here right now. Um, and we are going to talk about the big picture. So we talked about multiple models. These models are about climate, about hydrology, about lake, about social interaction. So how do we excite scientists to work together in an environment where everybody do their own work, everybody do their own experiments, and at the same time be able to make a contribution that has never been done before, a contribution to science, um, understanding how the climate change has been studied as its own field, um, and how this climate change can affect something like the water quality of Lake Champlain, going through uh, very complex processes in the middle, and amuse all those scientists together. So, as you can see, the, uh, the top left corner, we're talking about the climate downscale data. We have a large group uh, who are actually taking the data from various sources and downscaling this data to be able to make it in a resolution that we can actually start working with. And also we have the social scientist, and we have uh, Scott here, who has actually developed uh, an amazing agent-based model for how the, um, the interaction um, between scientists, uh, sorry, between pharmacists, uh, I apologize, <laughs> between ph uh, farmers and uh, between um, uh, decision makers, um, and how, how this is, uh, how you know, all the interaction between these two groups of individuals can actually affect the land use and how the land use can be transitioned from a uh, farming uh, land into um, development land or maybe abandoned in between and how the, uh, the land can be transformed from shrubs into forests, into trees, into crops, into uh, uh, cattles for, for uh, cattles to run around and roam for grazing. So all of these things have been actually developed by uh, uh, Scott's his team, or with the, uh, with the postdocs and uh, behind the scenes doing their science and experiments that um, Scott has made available. We also work with the hydrologists who are actually doing all the precipitation, understanding all the hydrological processes in between for the temperature and the precipitation, all the way down from where it happens until it reaches the ground. And then obviously we need a lake model that can actually um, be able to understand how the precipitation and how the temperature and how the climate change as a result of all of these things can affect the water quality. And as you can see again, this looks like a simple picture, but it's not really simple at all. Um, the area of study, in order for us to be able to understand this, we cannot study this globally. We have to focus on the Champlain, Champlain Basin and this is why we, 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 uh, we, make, we make a huge contribution because this lake is, a, is an amazing source, resource for Vermont, but not just for Vermont, but for also for New York and uh, the folks who live in, in Canada up there, uh, near the North Pole, where it can be freezing. But we don't care about that. <laughs> so, right now I'm, I'm enjoying Vermont and I'm, I'm happy with it. So anyways, Lake Champlain, going back to the point. So we need to understand how the climate change can affect the entire basin. Um, there are a few, uh, a few rivers, uh, the Mississippi River, the Minuski River, and so many other rivers. So in order for us to start somewhere, we actually uh, crop the top left corner, which is 22,000 kilometers square, 
Avalanche, <laughs> the North Pole dog is kind of affecting this. So um, we we basically decided to model the uh, Mississippi um, uh, Bay, um, and understanding that as a beginning of of this whole process and how we can possibly integrate all these models with uh, with all the different configuration parameters and all the different case scenarios that the scientists here are very excited to, to do, and we, uh, we finally were able to, uh, to <coughs> excuse me, to get somewhere based on uh, the use of integrated assessment modeling framework using Pegasus. Pegasus um, is basically what I'm, what I'm hired to do. As a computer scientist, I, I did a lot of work in scientific workflows and integration and data mining and all that stuff, and Pegasus comes uh, very handy for projects such as this one where, again, desperate models can be entirely working on their own, must be integrated in order to be able to draw a big picture and capture a big picture such as climate change and water quality down there on Lake Champlain. Um, so Pegasus was actually funded uh, as an NSF project in 2001, and it was in collaboration with the University of uh, Southern California and uh, the folks in uh, um, UW Madison. Um, so Pegasus is actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to speed up, is, uh, is an environment that is basically a compiler that can understand where the resources are located and what resources are needed to amuse one model and how this model can be worked, what executables are necessary for the software to actually work, and what, what executables and, uh, to produce and what data is going to produce and how this data can be processed in order to actually meet the expectations of the next model in line. So this is why we're using Pegasus. It generates abstract workflows, which means you can basically write an XML, you can write a little program that generates an XML file. This XML file can actually generate a humongous number of um, tests that you can throw on a cluster, uh, like the VAC here, like a, a university, small university cluster. Um, like the Yellowstone cluster or even the cloud, you can throw so many thousands of jobs based on that one simple abstract workflow which can be instantiated in multiple um, configurations. So the architecture of Pegasus, it uses wonderful languages that everybody probably here heard about using Java. We all drink coffee, so probably know about Java. Uh, we just saw some snakes, so probably know about Python too, which happens to be a programming language at the same time. We're all obsessed about jewelries, and so we know about pearls too. So uh, <laughs> um, these are the programming languages that everybody's very um, aware of. And you can actually interact with Pegasus using portals and also using composition tools as well. So you can actually drag and drop components and hook them up together. And then you can basically uh, start connecting models and then start having um, the interaction happen. So here is the engine where all the big things are happening. Pegasus takes all these uh, configurations using the XML files and then start mapping them and then the engines start crunching on them and then start pushing these um, jobs on the, large, uh, on, the, on the large cluster where there is a scheduler that's sitting and waiting for the resources to be available and once the resources are available it starts to run these um, um, jobs and these tests and it doesn't just do that and then goes to sleep, it actually keeps monitoring and then also storing data is called provenance. It is so important for us to be able to capture provenance so we know what's happening. Um, again, we're looking at a very large scale picture, so it is also very important to understand what's happening in between when we're integrating all these models together. So we can also run on the cloud, we can run on the Amazon, we can run on the cluster, university cluster, and so on and so forth. Enough of that. So in order for Pegasus to actually be able to work, it keeps track of three different categories. In case you're wondering how this Pegasus is magical, it's not really magical, it's logical. So it understands where the execution environment is actually happening. If you're running your platform, your, your workflow on a university cluster, you actually have to be able to specify where this cluster exists. You give it the URLs, you give it the ports, and make all the magic happens for the web servers to be up and running um, in order for you to actually specify the location. And then also understand if you're going to be running um, scripts in R, if you're going to be running scripts in C++ or JavaScript or any other language in the world, and on a Windows environment or a Linux environment, you really have to specify 
the executables using the transformation catalog. So the transformation catalog keeps track of all these executable files in order for you, uh, when, when, the, when the workflow comes to execute the model that you are interested in, it grabs executable, it understands where it exists, and to be able to run it in a native environment. And it also has to understand well, what input files are you We're talking about downscaling data coming from uh, the climate change. So we actually have to put these downscaling data in, in files somewhere. We need to describe that to Pegasus in catalog or replicant catalog. Um, workflows here, uh, Pegasus is a, is a very smart workflow environment. It is based on graph theory. So when you actually construct your model, you, you make whatever diagrams that you have conceptually in your brain. But as a matter of fact, when that happens, Pegasus generates its own framework, its own graph, based on the initial graph you specified. And then it clusters some jobs together based on how these jobs are described. It doesn't really tell you how it's running behind the scene, but you can see it if you require that of Pegasus. So it can run it in a much, in a super, super fast uh, fashion, as opposed to you know, the way we describe it without really um, trying to... I have one more minute. So this is a large picture. We have an agent-based model as we discussed. We have the climate. We have the hydrological model. We have the lake model. So here are the steps for, actually, for, for us to actually be able to do all these tests. We need to be able to run, uh, to read raster files generated by the agent-based model uh, folks. We need to be able to classify the land. We need to be able to generate maps. We need to be able to uh, uh, gather some indexes from other places. We need to be able to generate something called a word file. We need to be able to get all these models together in order for us to pass them to the hydrological models and uh, merge them together and then adjust them and uh, compare them and uh, collaborating them and all that stuff before we can actually simulate. This is the workflow after it was actually designed and instantiated by Pegasus. We saw a very simple picture. As you can see, there is an infinite number of, of processes that happen in between. A workflow, once it is generated, it generates the, uh, the code, the, uh, the graph, and this is one just simple file that you can describe the workflow in, in, in the code. I want to show you a little snapshot of the code. This is what the code looks like in the Python language. Once the workflow is executed, it takes 2.8 seconds to be executed, not to be fully <coughs> finished, not to be fully completed. But once it is executed, uh, the Condor actually throw it on the, on the cluster, and it takes about an hour or two hours based on the number of, of tasks that needs to be done. But it can actually run up to like a million instances with different configurations without waiting for one job to be terminated. So it doesn't actually go to sleep. It tells you statistics. And it keeps annoying me at 2 a.m. in the morning and sending me emails saying, your workflow started. A couple of hours later, I get up, your workflow is done, 100% complete. And I get a success here that makes me jump up and down and wake up my little girl. You know. <laughs> so um, we are still working on this. This is a, a work in progress. We're going to be doing a lot of markup languages. We're going to be doing code refactoring. We have not yet um, um, integrated the link model, so all of this is just a few models. I would like to acknowledge that this research has been done by the NSF and the UPSCORE. I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Patrick Clemen, Steve uh, Exler, and Dr. Dielman from the ISI. And if you have any questions. Okay, time for one question. I guess it's too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think this is something that you have developed. No, it's the ISI folks in California. And is that like an open source? It's an open source. If, uh, the reason why I actually decided to share this is because so many people here are doing integration, and this will be a really excellent solution for that. If you have any questions, please do. Thank you.